This is uh, what we just did together by assembling or writing the global stiffness equation for two elements. You will see it. So we have the element one, element two. We have these uppercase forces in red versus the lowercase forces F in green. We have the K1, the K2, and we came up with the global stiffness equations F equal to K times U. Okay. I would like to take this put together to solve a problem that you have done in solids. Okay, so here is the problem. I need to zoom in a little bit, right? Is that better? So what do we have here? We have two cylinders, AB and BC. And I'm gonna make sure to post these on, uh, on canvas. AB and BC. They are connected together at D, like the two elements one and two. Okay, they are axially loaded. There is one kip applied at B. It is fixed at A and at C, I do have a wall, but this wall is not touching C. There is a gap of 0 0.02 inch. The length of AB is 10 inches, length of BC is 12 inches. The area of BAB is 0.1 square inch of BC is 0.15 inch. Both of them are made of the same material, have the same modulus of elasticity of 10 mega PSI or 10 million PSI. We wanna find the war reaction, the internal forces and the displacement of B. You remember seeing problems like this in solids? Let me ask you, is this a determinate problem or indeterminate? Determinate. Okay, what's the definition of determinate? Number of equations is equal to the number of unknowns, right? By the way, in uh, statics, all what you did was determinant. In solids, you learned about indeterminate. In solid, in statics, you never have to use modulus of elasticity. Never even ask what it was made of because everything is determinant. When we have indeterminate, we need to learn about the material, okay? Now, how do I know whether this is determinant or indeterminate? I have to draw a free body diagram and start looking at the unknowns. What do you think the unknowns here are gonna be? Unknown forces. There is a reaction at A and possibly a reaction at C. So if, when I put this force, to push at B, if the end C is not gonna touch the wall, I don't get a reaction from the wall. And this would be a determinate problem, correct? But if C touches the wall, I get another reaction. So the first question, is it gonna touch the wall or not touch the wall? How do we figure that out? Hmm? Okay, I use the push at B and see how long much AB is gonna elongate. If it elongates more than 0 0.02, then it hits the wall, okay? So the first thing here, if C does not touch the wall, it's statically determined. And we only have one unknown support, the reaction at A and clearly it's gonna be one cap and that's it and we're done, right? So let's see whether it's gonna to touch the wall. If C hits the wall, 
then it's going to be statically indeterminate because we're going to have two unknown support reaction and we only have one equation of equilibrium. If it touches the wall, we're going to need compatibility equation. So if C doesn't touch the wall, the first scenario, then basically, however the distance B is going to move, is going to be the same as C. And this is going to be equal to the elongation of AB. Elongation of AB, PL over EA, and instead of PL, I always like to use the internal force in AB. So I call it the normal force in AB times the length of AB divided by E divided by the area of AB. Okay, we can uh, plug some numbers quickly. Here. And uh, I find that this delta C, which is equal to delta B, is equal to 0 0.01 inch. 0 0.01 inch is greater than 0 0.002. Right? So this means that C does hit the wall. And this solution is not good. So I'm going to need to go to another free body diagram that as consider here that C is going to hit the wall. Now when C hits the wall, I'm going to get an RC. So I have an RC and an RA. Now, the normal force in AB, is it gonna be still one kip? No. If you cut here and draw a free body diagram, it's gonna be equal to RA. The normal force in BC, if I cut here and draw a free body diagram, is gonna equal to RC. Please note that R, the member BC is in compression, while the member AB is in tension. You see that? Okay. So now, if I use my equation of equilibrium, some of the force in the x direction, I have here from my free body diagram, I have a minus Ra plus a thousand minus Rc is equal to zero. That's equation of, I can rewrite that as equation one, and this is based on equilibrium. Clearly, it has two unknowns. So this is an indeterminate problem. We need a compatibility equation. Now, where is this compatibility equation going to come from? It's going to come from the fact that at the end of the day, when AB and BC both change in length, that total change must be equal to 0 0.002. So I can write here my compatibility equation. Delta C, the displacement at C, is equal to the total elongation of AB and BC, the sum where delta AB is NAB, IA, LAB divided by EAAB, and likewise for BC. These two combines must be equal to 0 0.02. But from the free body diagram, we know that NAB is equal to RA, so I can substitute here for RA. And NBC is equal to minus RC because it's compression. So these two combined must add to 0 0.002. Now this is the second equation for RA and RC. Between equation one and two, I can solve for RA and RC, right? And once we have RA and RC, we can find the displacement at B and everything else. So this is the classical method that you have done and have seen in solid mechanics. Today, we want to solve this problem using what we just learned about finite element methods. So we want to use this approach. So I'm going to deal with the problem as two elements. So I'm going to use the finite element method to solve this problem. So I have the spring AB and a spring BC, like element one and element two. I need to evaluate K1 and K2. That's not difficult because we know that K1 is EA over L, EA over L. So I can find here K1 and K2. Now I really have 
three nodes and two elements, very similar to what we have here. So I can use the global stiffness equation that we just derived. If this was a new problem, I would have to write element stiffness equations, element stiffness matrix, element stiffness matrix, and then put it together. So now I'm gonna say F1 is the reaction RA. F2 is the force applied at two, 1,000 pounds. F3 is the reaction at C. Now we wanna solve for the unknowns. The unknowns in this case, we know that the displacement at three is gonna be 0 0.002. Displacement at one is a zero. Displacement at two is delta B. Now, if you look carefully, I have one, two, three unknowns. So I know I have three unknowns. I'm gonna write my global stiffness equations here. So I'm gonna take what I have here and substitute for it. So I'm gonna write for F1, I'm gonna have RA. For F2, I have 1000. For F3, I have the RC. Correct? And uh, U1, U2, U3, these are gonna be uh, zero. U2 or UB and 0 0.002. So I have here RA, 1000 RC, zero, delta B, and 0 0.002. For the coefficients of the stiffness matrix, I'm gonna use K1 and K2. I'm gonna take 10 to the power five as a common factor. I have here plus K1 minus K1. So one and minus one and a zero on the first row. On the second row, I have minus K1. Here I have K1 plus K2. So I have here a one and a 1.25. And then I have a minus 1.25 for minus K2, zero minus K2 and a plus K2. If you look at these, this global stiffness equations, give me three unknowns and three equations. K, E, A over L. Yeah, equation of a rod, stiffness of a rod. We discussed it in the presentation earlier. So I can use simultaneous equations to solve for R A, R C, and delta B. But how about the internal forces in each of these elements? I solved for the external forces and the displacements. Once I have my displacements, I can use the element stiffness equations for internal forces. Use the element stiffness equations and, and the calculated displacement. You remember the element stiffness equations were here. These are element stiffness equations. So if I know U1, U2, and I know my case, I can find my internal forces. And that's what I'm gonna do here. So we are, I'm gonna use K1 times the displacement at one, displacement at two. We find UB to be 0 0.00556. I get F11 to be minus 555.6 pounds. F21 is a plus 555.6. Why do I have different signs? Because if you look at one, a negative means it's going in the negative direction. If you look at two, positive means going in the positive direction. What does that imply? What's happening in AB? It's in tension, which is what we expected. You can apply element stiffness equation for BC and when we solve we get a plus 444.5 and a minus 444.5. If I show it here a plus is a push and a negative here sign 
would also mean a push. What I'm showing here, both of them are positive. But for F3, 2, I got a negative sign. So that means that BC is in compression of 445.5. Okay. Um, I would like you to reflect on that and uh, attempt to do homework five.